Welcome back to the Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast, and it's time to continue our comic book writing 101 series with our wonderful instructors, Mr. Mark Pellegrini of Common America and uh, GI or <laughs> yeah, and wish. USA yeah, GI yeah. <laughs> uh, fame, and also Mr. Aaron Sparrow, the writer of a lot of comic books, including uh, Darkwing Duck. He was also a, an editor for all the Disney works under the days of Boom Studios when they had the license. Both of them have a lot of, uh, of experience. Now, we've obviously, we've covered the technical stuff. We've done brainstorming, we've done outlining, we've done you know, you know, talking about scripting. Now it's time to get into kind of the fun stuff. Today we're going to talk about picking out your genre. Obviously, first up is with me is Mr. Mark Pellegrini. How you doing? Doing good, thanks. Glad you could make it. I'm surprised you guys both made it up. Obviously, we did have a time change for Daylight Savings, and all the way on the left coast, so waking up an hour earlier than normal. Mr. Aaron Sparrow, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, it was, wasn't too bad. Uh, I am a professional. Hey. I, can, I can show up on time. <laughs> I can show up on time, Jake. I gave myself a little wiggle room for the start time just in case. If you guys, my, my, you guys arrived at the last second. Here, here's a fun fact. My dad still calls me and reminds me about the time change. Even though, you know, my, my phone will automatically change. He'll, like, call me and he'll be like, hey, don't forget to set your clocks back. And the best part is he'll leave a message saying that it's him. Like, he'll be like, it's your dad. Tur turn your clocks back. And I'm like, dad, no one else. Even if I didn't recognize your voice, no one else is going to call me to tell me that. Complete you know, strangers call calling you up. Don't forget to change your clock. Yeah, it's like, it's your 11th grade gym teacher, Mr. Torbert. Turn your clocks back. <laughs> I know we haven't talked in 20 years, but... <laughs> All right, so let's get into this. Let's start talking about, about uh, comic book genres, picking out the genre for your story. Aaron, how is it that your story is actually going to dictate the genre that you choose? Well, I think, first of all, it's it's going to be something that you're interested in. So, you know, you're like, hey, I want to tell a story in space or I want to tell a fantasy story. Uh, you know, that's going to be kind of like where you're going to start. I think the one thing that you really need to consider when picking your genre right out of the gate is you have to decide how big your story is and if the amount of pages that you're gonna have to tell your story is going to be able to handle all of the world building that you're gonna have to do if you're creating a new kind of universe. So, you know, if you're doing something in space, you're gonna have to establish, you know, what the rules are of, of your story. You know, what, what is the government like? What is the, you know, depending on what, what your story is, you have to put all of that in. So you have to decide right out of the gate, do I have the space to tell the story that I wanna tell? And if you can't, if you're going to have to tell a smaller story, then you may have to just look at the core of what it is and maybe put it, you know, in, uh, you know, on, on Earth, you know, in the reality that we all know, uh, you know, in modern times, just so that you have that shorthand. Like people auto um, automatically understand, you know, you said it in New York City, you know, during modern day, people kind of know what to expect. They know what the world is like. But if you're going to go larger and you're going to go outside of that, you're going to have to have the, the pages to kind of world build and tell that story and set everything up. So that's probably the most important factor is, do I have the room to do this where I want? Can you explain on that, Mark? How is the, the story that you want to tell dictate the genre that you're allowed to kind of play in? Well, I mean, it's kind of like Aaron said that depending on the genre you, you want to use, it, your, uh, your world building or your exposition, whatever, whether it can be front loaded or seated or not really, uh, it's not really as important. So if you're doing like anything that takes place in some sort of alternate reality or timeline, like if you're doing a sci-fi story that takes place in the future, then you've got to explain to your audience up front um, in your story, like, this is the time period. This is how we got here. And, and, and this is the way things are. If you're in a fantasy world, it's a whole new universe, a whole new dimension. Like this is the name of the land. It's Hyrule. There's this bad guy named Ganon. Um, the character is Link. He's got to save Zelda. You got to set all that up. Whereas if it's like a horror story and it's just a bunch of kids going up to a cabin in the woods, you know, in the real world, that doesn't really require any front loaded exposition except for the characters and who they are and why they matter. Same thing with like comedies and stuff like that. So some genres are more complex than others. Obviously, if you if you have to do all that front loaded exposition and the hard part is trying to make is adding exposition without making it read like exposition. And that can be very, very uh, difficult and complicated in, in terms of writing. Um, well, it which can is, also really de be dependent on your artist because there can be mm. visual cues within your story that let you know 
this is on Earth, but it's a different Earth. Like maybe the Statue of Liberty exactly. is gold rather than bronze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You've got to give um, cues like that. If you want to have just a subtle visual uh, exposition that um, subliminally gets that across to the reader, you want to put that cue in your script. You know, panel one, um, uh, establishing shot of New York City, except the uh, Statue of Liberty is solid gold and the World Trade Center is still there. So we know it's an alternate timeline, you know, something like that. The Statue of Liberty is made of delicious cake. <laughs> yes. Something like that. That would kind of establish that maybe you were in some type of fantasy land or, you know, Alice in Wonderland kind of story. Now, Mark, one of the interesting things about stories, like you think about, uh, actually, Aaron, I'll send this to you since we were actually talking about this the other day. When people think about the movie Die Hard, they think of it as it like this action movie, you know, in a terrorist setting. But really, that's not what Die Hard is about, correct? No, no, Die Hard is, is, you know, at its heart, it's about a man trying to reconcile with his family. And we throw a bunch of additional, you know, complications in the way. And that, you know, that gives us our human drama. But that's why we care about John McClane. That's why we want to see him succeed. Not because he's the action hero and he's the good guy and he's fighting the terrorists, although there is an element of that. But you know, the main story is you want to see him reconnect with his family. You know, they've, they've established him as an everyman and you go on the journey with him. That's the other part about front-loading exposition, exposition that can be a problem. Uh, just to take a quick aside, um, because, you know, Mark was talking about where you're going to need to place that to set your, your world building. There's two ways to do it. You can go the Green Lantern movie route where they tell you, the audience, everything in the first 10 minutes, and then you spend the rest of the movie waiting for the main character to catch up. Or you can go the Star Wars route where they just thrust you into the middle of this fantastic world and then we meet Luke and then you have to go on the journey with him and you kind of have to discover it with him. That's the better way to do it. Mm -hmm. When you tell the audience everything that they need to know up front, uh, you're going to have a problem because now the audience is waiting for the character to get to where they are and it becomes boring. You become less interested. That's why uh, Green Lantern as a film didn't work. That's why Captain Marvel as a film didn't work. We already knew a bunch, well, one of the reasons Captain Marvel didn't work, but you, we already knew all of the things about the character that we should have discovered along the way, and waiting for the character to get there is, is dull. Star Wars is interesting that you bring that example up since it's it almost like it starts with both because it starts with that big text crawl that like so many like crappy Roger Corman movies always started with, you know, where but the text crawl is almost like you could just read the proper nouns like Galactic Empire, Death Star, Princess Leia, Darth Vader. OK, got it. And then, like you said, the movie, though, it introduces all of those proper nouns to you in sequence. And you still even though you had that front loaded exposition text crawl you still feel like you're going on that journey and learning those things as you move along through the, throughout the film, um, which is really Im impressive of Star Wars. So Mark, one of the interesting things, you know, we just talked about, you know, you, you need to know kind of at the core what your story is going to be. So if you want to tell a coming of age story, but then, you know, you want to do it in some type of like sci science fiction fantasy world, you, you it, that might work for you, it might not work because the genre that you're working in will ultimately dictate the audience that's going to be interested in the in the work as well, correct? Yeah, and, and sometimes it's kind of like um, what Aaron pointed out with like Die Hard is that you have the genres that your characters exist in, and that can be different from the genre your story exists in. And sometimes that can make for a much more interesting pairing. Like Die Hard is, a, is the story of, you know, a man who just wants to reconcile with his family but also he's in the building that's being laid siege by terrorists. And he's got to shoot everybody. Uh, like my, one of my favorites is, is Ghostbusters where, you know, if you want, if you just pare away all the, the cool shit, uh, Ghostbusters is a story of four guys trying to start a small business in New York city and wacky hijinks happen because it's a comedy. You know, if you told people that's what Ghostbusters was about and they, they put it in the DVD and they watch it and like, Oh, it's full of like, ray guns and and monsters and special effects and a giant stay puff marshmallow man who shows up at the end it's it's uh this this great pairing of like yeah it's a story about four guys trying to start a small business in new york and then it's all the things that you have to go through when you start a small business they gotta they gotta do their their search for property and real estate and finding the firehouse they gotta get permits they have to deal with the epa all those things but it's also got this Lovecraftian thing about um, a, an extra dimensional deity that's coming through into our world and opening a rift in, into the netherworld, bringing ghosts in and stuff like that. Whereas the characters all treat it 
as like, oh, well, it's just pest control. You know, ghosts are a thing that are common in this universe. And so common, in fact, that people would actually call a ghost busting service to get rid of the ghosts in their home or business. And these four guys are just trying to capitalize on that. And it's when you mix those sorts of genres, like who your characters are, the genre they exist in, and what your big picture story is, the genre that is, once you mix those two together, you can end up with something really unique and really interesting. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing about Ghostbusters is that the characters aren't action heroes. You've essentially taken four scientists who, you know, one of, one of which doesn't really want to do the work. You know, he, he's kind of lazy and doesn't really do the hard science and kind of a con man which, you know, gives you an interesting mix. And then you've got, uh, you know, you got Winston, who is like the employee that they hired. He kind of becomes the everyman. He's you in the story and that he is now dealing with all of these fantastical things. And he's just a guy looking for a paycheck, uh, you know, and then you've got the other two characters and they have their roles as well. But at the heart of it, it that's exactly what it's about. It's about the spirit of entrepreneurship. And uh, it's about the difficulties that you face in starting a business. And, you know, they're not action heroes. They're not they're not heroes at all. They're basically schlubby exterminators and they <laughs> caught up in something fantastic and they have to rise to the occasion. So, yeah, that you can really get those nice, you know, when you pair those things, it's like, yeah, we're doing this this genre, which is kind of like a horror action genre. Uh, but we're also telling this very like kind of human story. That's the things that make your story work. Also, Aaron, like when you think about it, if you if you wanted to tell, you know, a, a story about a group of entrepreneurs, but in a science fiction setting, but you wanted to have a bunch of elements that were more in line with maybe like a, a teenage female audience, you probably pick pick the wrong genre because you know an action science fiction setting is likely to, to bring in a more younger male audience. So when you're writing it, what genre you pick literally dictates what you're gonna have the, the tropes in in the style of writing that you're going to have to use to actually cater to the audience that's going to be interested in the genre that you're using. Yeah, I mean, and you can certainly break that. You can, you, but you're you're going to have to understand what the rules are and how to do it. Uh, you know, if you want to say like, hey, we want to do a story about you know characters that do space salvage. You know, the spirit of entrepreneurship. They're starting a, a business where they're doing salvage in space, and you want to make it female centric. You certainly can. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to tap into things that interest, you know, you, you've got to know your audience. And you say, okay, what am I trying to accomplish here? Who am I trying to appeal to? And you have to kind of like cater it in that direction, you know, put some things in there that are, you know, in, more interesting to, to women. But, you know, you've got the action and you've got the fantastical elements that are more, you know, um, a, just more attractive as a story to, to most men. Uh, it's, it's about finding that balance and, and like hitting the largest audience that you can. Uh, you know, I think that we're kind of entering a time where, maybe the, uh, the the demographics are starting to change and and you're starting to you know find out that you know women are interested in a little bit more th things than that you know than we can uh, than we than we previously thought or we previ previously marketed to them and you can kind of hook them in but you still have to find the things that interest them so mark obviously you've done a lot of work you know uh, with common america in, in USA GI you know it's, it's kind of it's it's kind of superhero but you've also got you know um, anthropomorphic animals, you know, fighting with guns in common America. It's kind of a, a, an every man who becomes a, a hero, but it's a, it's a female hero. She's, I believe she was a seamstress. She works for the USO and things of that nature. How were you able to transition that into a, a, a comic genre that's more geared towards men? Well, for, um, in the case of common America, I mean, with, with USAGI, it's almost easier uh, well, with the case of Common America, though, um, we try, like Aaron said, we try to hit on the universal themes that are kind of appealing to everyone. So it, so Carly's struggle uh, of dealing with uh, fraudulent people who are trying to take advantage of her and, and push her in directions she doesn't want to go in, trying to weed out the uh, the friends from the foes, the good influences from the bad influences. Those are those are like gender neutral um, situations that everybody falls into. Uh, when they're trying to apply themselves to whichever career they're interested in, it doesn't even have to be fashion, it could be anything. Um, so when you hit a, like a universal theme and it appeals to, to men or women, then it, it's, it's one of those things that doesn't apply to really, or it can apply, I mean, to any genre. You can tell a sci-fi story with, with that kind of uh, basic through line. You can tell a horror story, you can tell a comedy, um, et cetera. Um, and I think that's one of the aspects that, uh, like Star Wars, like other stories, 
uh, that appeal to both men and women. The Marvel movies, um, good or bad, they appeal to uh, to both men and women quite a bit. Is that they have elements in there that men and women like. I mean, if you go back to old adventure movies, you know, uh, they, those appealed to to both male and female audiences. But they had they were appealing for different reasons. You know, women enjoyed the romance of the swashbuckling hero. Uh, men in bo enjoyed the action of the swashbuckling hero. It's almost like men enjoyed the swashbuckling, women enjoyed the hero, but both, both men and women enjoyed the swashbuckling hero. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting? You guys have brought up the MCU, you brought up Star Wars. So Aaron, I want to juxtapose two two examples. Like obviously we, we had the, the original Star Wars came out. It's kind of a, you know, the, the hero's journey set in a sci-fi setting where you kind of relate to Luke. He's, he's going on this fantastical journey. You know, he's learning to, you know, to be a Jedi, it, it, it's it's overwhelmingly fun. Then you have the MCU kind of kick off and you're in this world of superheroes. But then when we get to the Phantom Menace, it's essentially a sci-fi setting, but it's kind of almost a political thriller kind of story rather than the hero's journey that we got in the original Star Wars trilogy. In the MCU, we get Captain America, the Winter Soldier, certainly another political thriller type uh, story, but set in the MCU, one of them works exceptionally well, and that is Captain America the Winter Soldier, where is the, the Phantom Menace in the, the Star Wars prequel series or trilogy being like a political story. It didn't really work in that setting, and the audiences, while they're both aimed essentially at the same audience, it was widely accepted by one audience and somewhat rejected by another. What about the execution and playing in the genres with that story type didn't, didn't work? Well, as far as the Phantom Menace was concerned, I'll, I'll tell you a quick, uh, quick story. Um, Tad Stones, the creator of Darkwing Duck, told me that when he was working at Disney, they had an Imagineers meeting and George Lucas came in and was talking to them because they, wanted to, they were building some things and they wanted to talk to him about irrigation uh, that he had put in on Skywalker Ranch because they were going to apply it to the parks because apparently Skywalker Ranch had really great irrigation. And uh, while he was there, Tad said, I, I couldn't resist. I had to ask him about Star Wars. This is before the prequels came out, obviously. And he said, George, I remember George telling me, well, you know, I want to do the first three at some point. Um, the technology isn't there yet uh, for what I want to do. But I don't know if people are really going to like them because they're going to be a departure uh, from, you know, kind of what they what the other movies were. Uh, they're going to be more political in tone and, and, you know, kind of more of a political thriller type, you know, type story with the intrigue and things like that. And he goes, I don't know how people are going to react to it. So going into it, George kind of knew he was going to do something different that maybe the audience wouldn't expect or, or respond to, which I think is, is really daring, you know, and obviously a person who has the money of George Lucas can, can take that kind of risk. That's the kind of risk that a studio would never, would never take. As we saw with Force Awakens, it was just a rehash of A New Hope because the studio is not going to take that risk. So for whatever you think of the prequels, you have to at least respect the fact that he was willing to do something different. He said, I want to do, you know, I want to break out from kind of the, what people expect. I think the reason that it didn't work is, you know, just from a technical aspect, I think that George was too far removed from, uh, you know, for, for the longest time, he had kind of like been, been living in the ivory tower of you know, being rich and being, being apart from people. And, and I think that he kind of lost that connection with the everyman and, you know, your, your working class people. You know, he kind of wanted to tell the story about this big political intrigue, but the interesting part is not necessarily the political intrigue. The interesting part is how does it affect your everyday people? How does, you know, what the Jedi are doing, you know, what's, what's the story on the ground? That's always the kind of, the human element was kind of lost in those movies. And I don't think that they made that mistake in the MCU with the Winter Soldier. I think you were very invested in the human characters. You were very interested in, you know, Captain America and obviously his connection to Bucky, even though it didn't have the impact of the comics because you didn't have all that history. You only had one movie with Bucky and I don't think that they established their relationship as well as they could have, but you still cared because you were invested in Captain America. And the main problem with the Phantom Menace and with the prequels is in that first movie, you're not really invested in anybody. There's no protagonist that you're going along with. There's like three different characters and four different characters that you're kind of following. Technically, Qui-Gon's the protagonist in the first one. But they never give you anything with Qui-Gon to connect you to him. He's kind of austere and, and a scholar, and, and we, we never really see any kind of human side of him. You know, even in his, I want, to, I want to protect this child, I want to teach this child. You don't ever really get like kind of a fatherly thing. They, there's no kind of relationship there that they establish that makes you care about it. 
Um, so you like him, but you're, you know, when he, when he dies, you kind of go, Oh, bummer. But that's about it. There's no real emotional impact to it. Yeah. The, the prequels had a hard problem with streamlining the stuff that could have just been said and not, and not shown. It's like, if you watch the original star Wars, there's that scene where the, the Imperial officers are having their round table meeting and one of them very, uh, I think it's a Tarkin, offhandedly yes. says, like, the Emperor has dissolved the Senate. He now has complete control. He just tells the audience and the characters that. Whereas in the prequels, they'd have shown the Senate meeting and they'd have shown Emperor yes. Palpatine dissolving the Senate and that whole long process. And it would have bored everyone to tears. Whereas the, mo the original Star Wars knew, like, that's just something you can just say instead of show and get it over with in five seconds. Um, that, that kind of aspect that there, there's an aspect, I think in writing, we all, you have to understand, yes, that if you're working in a visual medium, you need to show and not say most of the time, but there are times when you can just fast track some of that stuff. That's not going to be interesting and the audience will be a okay with it. <laughs> yeah. Another you know, thing I have a good idea, man, but, but the execution is mm -hmm. important. You know, he didn't have a chasm in there to kind of like streamline his ideas and say, okay, well, what's the heart of this? Let's get to that quicker. Yeah, you know, George was able to kind of indulge all of the things that he'd been working with in his head. And this is, you know, important for you as a writer. Don't get too caught up in your details. It's great to have all of those details like written out so that in your head, you know what the world building is. You know where you're going, but you don't have to show all of that to the audience. Mm -hmm. You don't have to play your entire hand. So, Mark, one of the interesting things uh, kind of about that is in Star Wars, they're supposed to be in a galaxy far, far away. And, you know, you know it's not supposed to be anywhere near our own world or really anywhere near our own political system, correct? I mean, yeah, and it's also, yeah, it's yeah. a long time ago. So even if you went yes. to that galaxy far, far away, everyone's dead. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's not really supposed to be connected to us. But not only do we get these big scenes in the Imperial Senate, or not the Imperial Senate, it's the Galactic Senate at that point. And, you know, we get a little Easter egg, you see ET and stuff like that, but they're really boring, they're really bogged down. But another problem, I when I was watching it, is there are so many moments of dialogue that are directly ripped out of what was going on in the political landscape in America, specifically from George Bush's own mouth that kept showing up in the dialogue in that movie. And when you hear it, I immediately stop thinking about the movie I'm watching. I'm going, you're either with us or against us. I'm like, okay, that's George Bush. And I, there is a series of these over and over. And, you know, it, it, it kind of takes you out of the movie because it's it's too connected, like verbatim to what I'm experiencing in my real life at the moment. Yeah, and you you have to think about the kind of story you're writing, um, whether it's something that you want to have almost like exclusively contemporary appeal or something you want to have perennial appeal. And there's nothing wrong with doing an either or. I mean, there's lots of media that's made to appeal in the now. And that's fine, especially comedy. If you're doing like, you know, a late night comedy that needs to be topical, it needs to be with the times, then you got to write something that is meant for the here and now. Uh, people can call that disposable content, but that makes it sound worse than it is uh, to make something that's just meant for contemporary audiences like South Park. South Park episodes are literally made in the same week as the content they're making fun of. Um, and they're notorious for like, being able to produce an episode within 24 hours of, of the news cycle happening. And that's um, that's really impressive of South Park for an animated series to be able to do that. They're the only ones who can. But it also means that, you know, 15 years later, when you go back and you watch a rerun of South Park, it feels like you're watching a time capsule. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of like that, you know, because I was I lived through that. I was there. Um, I sometimes wonder how younger people who weren't alive <laughs> during like the Bush administration go back and watch the episode. Either they're going to be completely lost, like what are what is this guy talking about, or they're going to be like, oh, how quaint. Um, this was meant for the people of 2004. You know, <laughs> yeah, is, people say quaint. Is satire on modern culture, like in the moment. Exactly, and and. You have to, it's like, yeah, this is a genre thing, is that you have to know, is this appropriate for what I'm writing? Um, if you're writing Star Wars and it's just full of, you know, Bush references, if you're writing, you know, a, a sci-fi thing, you can, you can write them sly enough that audiences 15 years later won't know you're making fun of Bush or Trump or whatever, or you can be so obvious you have, you know, this character who is the president of the galaxy 
and he keeps mispronouncing well, words Newt like Gunray, nuclear, right? Newt, <laughs> Newt Gunray, yeah, right. You you do things that that are so obvious that it. Fifteen years later, people are just going to roll their eyes and go. Ugh. It's like I like this um, uh, horror movie series called Reanimator, and uh, it's by uh, Stuart Gordon and Brian Yesna, and uh, it's, it's the one that that's got um, Jeffrey Combs as Herbert West Reanimator. They made three movies, right? And three movies are really good. I, I enjoy them. They tried very hard to make a fourth movie, and I'm glad it didn't happen because the fourth movie was going to be called House of Reanimator. And it was going to be about uh, Jeffrey Combs as Herbert West getting um, kidnapped by the U.S. government because Dick Cheney died. And he was the one who was the mastermind behind George Bush. And George Bush can't do anything without Dick Cheney. So they have to get the reanimator to go to the White House and bring Dick Cheney back to life as a zombie so he can tell uh, George Bush what to do. And the presidency can continue on. But then, oh, no, zombie hijinks happen in the White House because of all that. And like. That sounds awful, and <laughs> that would have dated that movie so badly. I can watch Reanimator one through three anytime because they're timeless. Whereas they made a, if they had made a fourth movie that was just so embedded in the here and now of when it was made in the political landscape, it would have aged like milk, and it wouldn't have fit in with the rest of the series. So I mean, that's that's a case where being contemporary does not fit with the genre or the franchise or the series of what you're writing. Absolutely. So one of the interesting things that I think that are, that's exciting is when you start uh, combining your story genres. And one of my favorite ones, Aaron, is your sci-fi Western. Mm -hmm. I, I just love that setting. I really like Westerns, but really, you know, in a Western setting, you can tell some kind of more moralistic tales about current society. But with all the technology that's kind of being burdened down on you and it feels like you're under surveillance 24 seven, the idea of somebody getting fed up with it and going to the outer rim to escape it, to go back to a, a more simple life. Like it, it kind of resonates with people. I really feel like like a sci-fi Western is a really good uh, com com combination of story genres and you can really play with that that's, you know, that, that people can, can res or understand. What are your thoughts about combining story genres? Well, you know, um, it's funny, long before The Mandalorian came out and long before uh, the Disney purchase of Star Wars, uh, I had a pitch, uh, you know, I'd worked with Tokyo Pop, and at one point we were getting, uh, it looked like we were going to get the Star Wars manga license, uh, you know, so we were all pitching stories for that, uh, and one story, you know, and I, I tried numerous times to get uh, to get stuff uh, done at Dark Horse when they had the Star Wars license, but, you know, I just, I was never in that exclusive clique of, uh, of writers that they, they pulled from. But, you know, I had a Boba Fett story that I wanted to do that was very much a Western. It was him stuck on a small planet and having to defend a, a family in a town who had nursed him back to health after he was injured. And, you know, had a lot of themes that pulled from the, you know, the, the history of the character and, you know, m moments with his father, it, you know, just things like that. But it was essentially a Western. It was, you know, I could tell that story with any character in a earthly Western setting if I wanted to. And the only, you know, wrinkle was that I was like, well, I want to tell this story with Boba Fett. So when they went to, and I think it's a natural fit. So when they did the Mandalorian, they were like, well, let's, let's make this kind of like a space Western because it very much goes along with the character, the idea of bounty hunting. And, you know, these are all things that George loved and, and pulled into his stories. Uh, I think that the bounty hunters definitely had a, uh, you know, a, a touch of, uh, you know, Westerns that he probably watched when, when he was a kid and, and he would have liked to, you know, told some stories in that realm too. So I definitely agree with you. The, the sci-fi and the Western genres, they, they go together really well. Um, but again, Star Wars is not a science fiction movie as much as it's a fantasy movie. It's, you know, everybody knows it's, it's the, the hidden opera. castle. Yeah, it's the <laughs> hidden castle. It's Kurosawa in space. Uh, you can definitely do that. You can, you can take your story and you can set it in, in a fantastic world. You just have to be ready to do the world building and to, you know, to do the work. But, you know, ultimately, the hero's journey that's a theme. That's a, that's something that you know you can you can play with. You can tell that story anywhere. You can tell it in a fantasy setting. You can tell it in the space setting. You can tell it in a western setting. These you know. So I think more than, what you want to focus in on is you can have you can pull from current events, but if you want to make your story more timeless, you can't be on the nose. You have to think of what is the universal theme of this event. You know, is it is the the Patriot Act? Is it you know surveillance? That the theme is you know the government cracking down. It's the government, you know, watching what you're doing. It's the government becoming more oppressive. Well, you can tell that story. You can tell a story with that theme in any kind of genre, and it doesn't have to be on the nose. You know, you just make it a little more vague, and then your story will be more timeless. Uh, you know, one of the things that Star Wars got bogged down in, like you said, was pulling quotes from the current political landscape that, you know, people watching it now won't, won't remember that. 
you know, kids that, that put on the prequels, they're not going to know when Anakin says, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy. They're just going to know it's a clunky piece of dialogue delivered badly, uh, you know, by an actor that wasn't being directed properly. Um, you know, so if they get taken out of the movie, it'll be because of that, not because of the current events, but because we all lived through it. When we watch it, we go, oh, that's a reference to the thing. And, you know, you're no longer thinking about Star Wars. You're thinking about the time period from which it was, set, uh, you know, pulled. So, so Mark, when you're doing, like, um, combining genres, I know you're an enormous horror fan. Yep. You could mix horror with anything. So let's say you want to do a science fiction horror movie, Alien or something. Does one of those genres have to be primary when you're writing it? Does one of them have to, to step up and be the primary genre that you're writing with, with sci-fi elements within a horror story? Or it has to be a sci-fi a story with horror elements to it? Well, you should think of them as parts of a machine. And each, each part should serve the next. So you have like your characters, the genre they're in. Like if your character is like, essentially your character is like a cowboy, right? You know, he, he's an old, or a bounty hunter. You know, he's someone who stepped out of a Western. And he's living this Western story. And that's the core there. Then you have what's happening to your character. And it can be the horror setting. Your character may be, you know, a bounty hunter, but the action that's happening to him is a monster is a descending upon him. And he's got to fight this monster. And then you have the genre of your world. You know, think of them as like three spheres. And the outermost sphere is a genre of the world. Like, oh, he's a bounty hunter from a Western fighting um, a supernatural monster in space. And now you've got like, you know, your your sci-fi aspect and it's, it's almost like um you know you get your large medium small thing going on but you should always start with your character and and build the genres out outward from there and so that's how you end up with something like you mentioned alien and an alien is like a perfect example of that um the core of of that narrative is you have the crew of the nostromo and they are blue collar workers who are just working salvage Explorers. on on their what they're essentially what, what could be if this hadn't been a, um, a sci-fi movie it would have just been a steamer ship, you know, out on the ocean, you know, and but then they have this monster that's on the ship with them that they that's killing them, and they got to kill it first. So now you get your horror sphere, but they're also it's a sci-fi film, and they're out in space, and that's what traps them on the ship. Why they can't just get out when they you know and run away because they're on, they're on a ship, and so you've got those three spheres, and they each serve each other, and that's how why it works so fluidly. A lot of people don't put in that sort of preliminary work of like how do these this mixture how does this mixture of genres serve each other to tell a cohesive, um, lucid story. Uh, a lot of Roger Corman movies. I love Roger Corman. I often love Roger Corman movies because they're senseless and weird. Um, when he was doing his his big like I want to make Star Wars movies um, for a tenth of the budget, you know he was he was knocking off Star Wars, but the people making those movies weren't really paying attention to how Star Wars worked and how all the pieces came together. And so you ended up with like all these like total nonsense movies, Battle Beyond the Stars, stuff like that. Or he, he really went in all in on making alien knockoffs. Um, but that's how you get like Galaxy of Terror. And as much as I love Galaxy of Terror, it's like, OK, so it's a sci fi story about um, a bunch of people who go to like this temple on another planet um, and it's full of monsters, but the monsters are their psychic impressions of their deepest fears, but also one of them has to survive so they can become the new galactic emperor or something like what? <laughs> Nothing in this is making any sense. And as an audience member, you can tell that the pieces weren't put together properly um, as opposed to something like uh, Alien where everything just tessellates so fluidly and intrinsically, the world building is all there. It doesn't have to tell you. You can, uh, and, and a good way to know if your story is, is strong, if you've got the pieces assembled correctly, is once you have it kind of assembled, ask yourself, if I took this out and I just inserted the core story into another genre, would it still work? Uh, you mm. know, it won't work necessarily work in every genre, but would it still work? So like in the case of Alien, like, uh, like Mark was saying, it, you set that on a steamer ship, you can tell essentially the same story. You know, they're from salvagers. They're out, you know, in the middle of middle of the ocean. They pull some stuff up. There's some wreckage. Some, you know, some creature gets on a guy's face, you know, some deep sea creature, you know, and we can tell the same the same story. Something grows and now it's running amok on the ship and we can't get back to shore and we don't have any communication. You can tell the same story. It still works. But, you know, you just put it in a different genre. Well, that's a, that's a good good point here, Aaron. You transitioned me right to kind of the last thing we want, we want to talk about here. Now, when you're writing your story, 
Mark, how how much should you be? I'm sorry, I'll throw this one, Aaron. How much you, should you be considering the current reader trends? Let's say, Aaron, you're a, a fantastic science fiction writer, mm -hmm. and you've done you've got you, you've got some science fiction, you've got some action. Let's say you've got a, a good perspective science fiction script out there, but the hottest thing right now is a YA comic comic book. That's the format that people are. That's really driving the sales right now. Should you just up and even though you are a competent or even a very good science fiction writer, should you try and convert all that stuff over to YA comics because that's where the money is, or should you stick with your bread and butter and stick in your in your own wheelhouse? Well, I think it's it's always see that's a that's such a toss up because I think it's always good to break out and try new things. Uh, you know, I think that you're going to stretch yourself as a creator that way. Uh, I, I got a really good piece of advice from uh, from Bob Shrek at one point at the convention where he said, when you have two choices on the table and one of them, you know, and all other things being equal, one of them is really scary and the other one is comfortable and safe, take the scary one. And he said, because even if you fail, ultimately that's the one that you're gonna grow the most from both personally and creatively. And I always thought that was really good advice. So I think that, you know, it's always good to get out there and take a risk and to do something different and to challenge yourself. That being said, I think it's a bad idea to chase trends. Uh, for the longest time, um, you know, when I, when I worked at Boom, that's kind of what the uh, the owners were doing is they were just chasing trends. But the problem was by the time the trend had come out and, you know, and was hot and then they got their version of it into production, you'd be a year, a year and a half down the line. And that trend had ended. And now they were putting it out into a market that was kind of like, oh, well, we've seen this before. So I think that it's it's a delicate balance of, you know, how long do you see this trend lasting? You know, do can't do you really have something to say? I, I wouldn't say that it's a good idea to chase just because it's the trend, just because it's currently successful. I think that if you've got something to say and you think, hey, I could really put this in there and it would really work in that in that new genre, you know, in the YA novel, this this story could really work, then I think go for it. But you know, otherwise, just to do it for the sake of this is what's popular right now. I, I think that's nine times out of ten, that's going to be a, red, a recipe for disaster. Mark, right, it's, it's, oh, it's sorry. I, I, just wanted seen... to, I just wanted to bring one thing in on that real quick. I'm sorry. Um, you also just have to consider that if this is your story and it's important to you, you only have one chance to tell that one story. And if you add something to it or if you let something influence you that manhandles or mangles that story. I mean, that's it. That's the version that's going to be out there in the world. And unless, you know, you get some sort of like Snyder cut opportunity to completely retell your story, which most people don't, that's what's going to, that's what's going to exist forever. And you, you'll always be disappointed with it. I mean, look at like cinematic universes, that trend and, and how that just polluted everything for about 10 years because everybody wanted to be Marvel and how many lost opportunities there were. Uh, you know, Universal wanted to make new Universal classic monster movies like The Mummy and Dracula, but they also wanted to chase the Marvel trend of doing a cinematic universe. And how many like failures to launch did they have? They had like Van Helsing, Dracula Untold, The Mummy, and each one was just like, oh God, like we're trying to set up a cinematic universe and we just keep whiffing it. Or a uh, 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 Scoob, that Scooby-Doo movie. Like we could have had a really good high budget animated Scooby-Doo movie, which you know seems like it would be so easy to do, but they wanted to do the Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe. So we get a movie that, that spends a whole time trying to set up Captain Caveman and Dick Dastardly and all, and all this other bull crap when people just want to watch a Scooby-Doo movie. And that's the version that's out there. That's the version that's crap. And they, they whiffed it. They missed their opportunity to tell a fun Scooby-Doo movie. Um, so yes, it's, it's like Andrew said, you could take the safe option. Um, Maybe that'll make you more money because you're on autopilot, you're chasing a trend. But if it's a story you're passionate about and you want to tell properly and you want people to appreciate, uh, just know that the version that you put out there is the version that's going to be out there forever and you'll never get another chance. I love that it really in, in Mark's oh. mind, my name is Andrew. Did I call you Andrew? <laughs> what what, what does that make? Yeah. How, many, how many A it names have I good. called you? <laughs> it's mostly Andrew. You just really want me to be an Andrew. It's, you know what? <laughs> so <laughs> shut so up, Mark, Andrew. <laughs> you, you bring up a very good point. We're seeing something right now, and I, you know, I kind of brought up the example early. Is the YA graphic novel market is is pretty hot now? We're seeing growth there. We're not seeing so much growth in the superhero market. So what you can tell what DC has done with a lot of their recent YA graphic novels that they put out, which would probably be, 
probably been in production for upwards of 18 to 24 months to get these out because they're well over 100 pages each. Is you can tell that they went out and they found people that had written in the YA graphic novel sector, probably already had stories written, but then paid them to essentially change the character names, make them DC characters, and release them. And it's frustrating to, to people that enjoy the DC Comics universe because the characterization is completely off. The stories don't really match the characters. And then the YA graphic novel audience isn't interested because they're, they're not there to read DC mm. Comics. They're there to read, you know, slice of life coming in age stories for YA graphic uh, creators. But that's what's out there. And so we're having all these, you know, big changes to characters or, or what feel like are changes to characters, but really they don't, they're they not going to mean anything in the long run because nobody ended up buying them. And they were all, like you said, with smart. Yeah. And I think obviously, you know, like, oh, if I ran the zoo, this is what I do. And, you know, we'd all be millionaires. You know, it's like that Batman episode that has that title. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the idea, the problem that a lot of the comic book publishers is have, having is that they always want to chase the audience they don't have. And there's nothing essentially wrong with trying to attract a new audience to your product. I mean, that's how your product grows. The thing is that you don't treat it as an all or nothing sort of thing is that because then you drive away your current audience. So you have all these superhero books and you have the people who read superhero books and enjoy them the way they are. But if you completely change your entire line of stories over to this young adult style narrative to try and attract the young adult style audience, then you drive away the, the guaranteed revenue of the audience you have for this phantom audience that may, may or may not exist and may or may not buy your books. The better idea would be to keep most of the books appealing to the current audience that is buying them, the guaranteed revenue, and do one or two books uh, that appeal to this possible audience that may exist and may get attracted to those books have different flavors out there that appeal to everyone, like going to a Baskin Robbins, but they only serve uh, strawberry ice cream. Like, okay, I guess I'm gonna go someplace else, but no, they've got 32 flavors. So they, they don't get rid of one just because more people are coming in and enjoying vanilla. They don't get rid of chocolate. Uh, well, that's interesting, and Mark. They had one YA graphic novel that succeeded beyond their dreams, outsold all the other ones. It's called Primer. And do you know which DC Comics character is the star of that one? Heck no. It isn't one. It's a brand new character written and created for a YA graphic novel audience. And shockingly, that's the one that's got the cover that they were attracted to and the story that has them coming back. All they had to do was create new characters written for right. that audience rather than trying to translate their current characters that, that don't appeal to that audience. And it, it didn't work. But when they did the original thing, it actually did. So I, I well, think that's going to basically start to wrap up our, our genre discussion. We'll start doing the, the questions from the viewers. If you do have questions, definitely get them out now. Mark, is there one last thing or some, a few points you want to hit on before we get to the viewer questions? I mean, I think we cover the genres pretty well, but um, just something that popped in my head because you were talking about how like, oh, they, they take these characters, these pre-existing characters and reformed them to appeal to the young adult audience because that's what's hot right now. And that's that idea that 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 trend is something that's been around for a while. Remember in the early 2000s when they were really starting, every studio was pumping out Marvel and superhero movies because all, all the Marvel rights were like scattered to the wind between Fox and, and Disney and, and Sony and Universal, et cetera. And the actual Marvel comics kept trying to change the way the characters looked or their costumes or whatever to reflect the movies because they thought that they could bring in the mainstream movie audience because that was when like, oh, the... Brian Singer X-Men movie came out and the X-Men all wear tactical black leather out body suits. And so all of a sudden in, you know, new X-Men, all the, the X-Men are, are wearing these black leather body suits uh, with no masks, no costumes. Um, or like uh, the, that crappy Daredevil movie came out and Colin Farrell's bullseye had the bullseye tattoo in his forehead. So up suddenly in, in the Daredevil comics, bullseye's got a bullseye tattoo in his forehead. I mean, that, that sort of idea, that, that sort of, um, aspect is something that's always existed in comics is that they, they always want to the the publishers the executives they always want to try and mimic what they think is popular at the time and it almost 
never works. <laughs> it's when they go back to their bread and butter that things are okay. When they try to uh, copy what's popular in the mainstream, it just never works. <laughs> so I think the bottom line is do not follow the trend. Be a trendsetter. Exactly. All right, Eric, do you have anything, last words for the, for this genre conversation we've had before we answer a few of these uh, questions from uh, viewers? Yeah, I've actually got to I've actually got to dip out pretty quick here, but um, let me uh, let me just say that you just kind of follow up what Mark said. You know, when you when you do that, when you try to find that new audience at the expense of your current audience, you know, we're we're seeing it time and time again. You shoot yourselves in the foot. Uh, you know, with Star Wars, Kathleen Kennedy decided she wanted it to be a property that appealed to girls. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with attracting the female audience, but you end up violating the heart of what it is. Star Wars was designed by George Lucas, and he said this on numerous occasions. It was designed as a property that would appeal to boys and that would sell merchandise to boys. So boys loved Star Wars. There were girls that loved Star Wars too. They already existed. They were already there. But, but Kathleen Kennedy wanted to tweak it so that it would appeal to more girls. But they didn't really know how to do that. They didn't really understand how to do that. And what they did is they ended up killing it as a boy's property and it just kind of became a property for no one. And that's the risk that you run when you do these things, these YA, you know, pastiches where you just like try and attach the DC characters to the, uh, to the YA market, is you end up producing a product that satisfies no one, and then you have no audience, and your company starts to, you know, starts to tank and starts to have money problems. And instead of right. course correcting and fixing it, you know, the, the knee-jerk response is to blame the audience. And that <laughs> is, you know, that's, <laughs> it's, it's corporate decision-making at its worst. You know, uh, you, don't, you have all of these suits who come and make these decisions. They're not creative people, but they're the people who've been placed in charge because they have a degree or they went to school and, you know, they've got that piece of paper that says that they should be able to do this. And they will give you notes that, may, you know, they will give you edicts that end up ruining your company and ruining the appeal because they don't understand it. Yeah. All right, Aaron, I, I guess that's, that's going to be it. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I guess you're going to dip out or you're going to be able to stick around for a couple more. No, I've actually, I've actually got to go, but uh, I will, uh, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to, uh, if anybody wants to hit me on Twitter or anything with any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or in the, Thank or you very much. Comments, you know, when this gets posted, I can go through and, and answer questions. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See ya. All right, Mark. Are you counting your coins or something? Oh, oh, you can hear all that. Sorry. No, I was, I was picking up all the stuff on the ground so I could vacuum in a minute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. So we basically, we've had our genre discussion. There's going to be, a, there's a few questions from the viewers. If you have any questions, definitely get them in now and we'll, we'll shoot them over to Mark. Obviously he's the, he's the professional. I'm just the schlub here. So this is from my good friend, Dion Dominic Powell. What are your thoughts on a series of books, be it novels or graphic novels, that explores different genres like Planetary by Warren Ellis, John Cassidy, and Lauren Martin, where you're talking about a, a series of stories with different genres between the stories. So that's actually something I, I was waiting for an opportunity to bring up. So one of my all-time favorite horror franchises is Phantasm, and it's five movies. Uh, and it's a horror series. It's kind of a horror sci-fi Lovecraftian series that covers a whole gamut. And its core base is as a horror series, but each film is written and shot as a different genre. The first Phantasm is a coming of age film. And if you just watch Phantasm one by itself, you could interpret it as an allegorical film about a young boy dealing with uh, grief and the loss of his family who died in an accident and how he overcomes and copes with the concept of death personified as the tall man. It's, it's an allegorical coming of age uh, young boy story. Phantasm two, is an action film full of guns and chainsaws and car chases and, and all that cool stuff. Phantasm 3 is a comedy. It's got comedy relief zombies. It, it's got a, a chick who fights the, the flying spheres with nunchucks. It's, it's got sidekicks. It's got this little kid that looks like he stepped out of Home Alone. Um, and it's a goofy comedy. Phantasm 4 is a Western. There are showdowns um, at high noon or high midnight out in the desert, in the badlands, in the wastelands. Um, Phantasm Five is a post-apocalyptic movie, and it, it's, it's the last film in the series, and that's how it ends. It, it shows everything, this, this post-apocalyptic wasteland where the monsters have taken over. And each film feels completely distinct, but those genres are each tailored to the story, the mythology, and the narrative. So it still feels cohesive. And there are some I, do, I like more than others, and some I don't really like much of at all. 
Uh, three and five, I think, are the weakest installments in the series. But I, I know the difference between three and five because they, they're a different genre and they are totally unique movies. And I think that if you have a singular creator who's got his entire world in mind, his characters, their narrative arcs, uh, the mythology of his world, the villains, where they come from, what they're doing, um, how it impacts the the, uh, uh, the world of your story, then you can tell like, each chapter as a different genre as long as you you plan it out ahead of time and it's all cohesive, it can work. Yeah, the MCU, when it first came out, it was still really exciting. All the movies were different genres within the Super Hill MCU mm -hmm. universe. And, I think and then that's they all kind of most coalesced exciting. into a... They, they all started out that way, definitely. Yeah. And then they all kind of, by like, I guess, phase two or whatever, the executives found like, oh, okay, this Joss Whedon style of, of quirky sitcom-esque comedy and humor is what people like. So all of our movies moving forward are going to have that same tone. And then all the movies kind of just turned into a gray blob, and I can't tell one from the, the other. MCU soup. So thank you so much to Dominic Powell for the question. We've got another question for Sam Keshi. How do you become knowledgeable about different genres? For example, for a Western, you might need to study up on the relevant American history, perhaps of the of the time period or maybe the, the region of America that you want to uh, tell your story in. I mean, if you're doing a period story regardless and you need to be authentic to that uh, setting and the history of the moment, then yeah, you, you got to do your research. Um, if you're doing something where the, the history is not important to the story where if you're telling you know the story about the gunfight at the OK Corral then yes you're going to want to do your research about what happened at the gunfight at the OK Corral who is Wyatt Earp uh, who is Doc Holliday who are the Clintons you know how did they die how did the gunfight go down uh, what was Tombstone like at, uh, back then Ari like what state was Tombstone in Arizona you know you want to have all that stuff but if you're just telling a western and it takes place out in the desert you know the and it's got nothing but fictional characters in the fictional town in it, then those details aren't as important. Just make sure that if you're going to uh, name the president, that it matches who was uh, in office that year, that kind of thing. Uh, if your story takes place in Arizona, just make sure that the uh, topography and the geography of Arizona is correct and the weather is correct, that kind of thing. Um, it, you just have to tailor it to uh, this type of story you want to tell, what is important and what isn't important. Like, like Aaron was saying, there are details that uh, if they are vital to the story, then yes, do your research and put them in there so that people can understand uh, where and when and, and why this takes place. If they're not important, then you can just breeze over them or ignore them, you know, then it's just superfluous. Thank you very much, uh, Simteshi, for the question. Uh, we do have another one. This one is kind of a question. I'm gonna treat it like a question because I think this is really good. This is from Stuart Jones. I do reviews for a lot of indie artists, and the most common setting I encounter is the post-apocalyptic one. I wonder what it is about that specific setting that draws writers to pen for that. Now, here's my my theory, Mark. I might be wrong. I think in the post-apocalyptic setting, you basically have a blank slate, but you don't have to do as much world building because everything's been destroyed. You can have some right? visual cues of like, hey, you know, Wrigley Stadium is half there, and you know, obviously we're near Chicago. But you don't have to have a government. You don't have to have any any of that set up. And you can just kind of really randomly encounter things. It, it is. It does kind of make it easier. Um, and it's something that happens a lot. I almost think that the convenience of a post-apocalyptic setting, it was popularized for filmmaking convenience. Because then you can just film in a... A city, you don't have to worry about extras. You don't have to worry about the landscape looking nice. Um, you can just film in like the back alleys of Vancouver. And if you can't get the New York skyline in shot, you can just say, oh, that's because the, the skyscrapers were all blown up. <laughs> you, know? you, you can do something. It's really cheap and easy uh, to film post-apocalyptic movies. And that's why they were all over the place in the 80s. Um, and so that sort of just trickled down into uh, other popular media. You know, and so now we have lots of post-apocalyptic stories. I think a lot of it's just influenced because like zombie films, like zombie movies and stories and comics, they're almost always post-apocalyptic stories about, because Dawn of the Dead was so popular and it influenced everything. So now we have all these stories about, oh, zombies have overrun the world, you know, they're the walking dead. Uh, and that's 
over and over and over again, we get those stories about zombies um, just all over the place. And I get kind of tired of them. I, I think it's oversaturated. I think post-apocalyptic stories can work, but it's a genre that we've seen so much of. You kind of do need to do a new spin on it. Got to do something different. Right, yeah, you can't just keep making... And that, that's what separates Italian horror films, honestly, from, uh, I don't know, more innovative ones. So I, I, I watch a lot of horror movies, and I watch a lot of Italian horror movies, but the Italian cinema landscape of the 70s and the 80s defined itself as a mockbuster industry. They looked at what was popular and making lots of money in the, in the US and the West, and they made a low budget version of it. Like every Italian filmmaker was Roger Corman, essentially. And that oversaturated the market. But you watch those movies and you realize they are not doing anything new. It's just Dawn of the Dead with less money. It's just Alien with less money. It's just Terminator with less money. They're not putting a spin on it that makes it interesting. Whereas the movies that, that really persevere throughout time, they put something on it, like Back to the Future. Like, oh, it's just a time travel movie. Why is Back to the Future so special? Like, well, it's a time travel movie, but look at how it's made. The special effects in Back to the Future only happen twice in the movie, at the beginning and the end. Everything in between is just a fish out of water comedy. But that's not how people remember Back to the Future, because it's so innovative with, with its idea. Uh, you have to have that hook, and that can be the hardest thing. And that, that's almost why it's like not even, I wouldn't even qualify it as advice. Like, oh, you want to be successful? Well, just think of something nobody else has thought of before. Like, oh, geez, that, that's great advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to have your own spin. It wants to feel different because you don't want to be a copycat of everything else, you know? Exactly, and that's how you. That's end why, up like, with um, those. <laughs> what is it? Train to Busan. It's a Korean zombie film. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there are elements that are very similar to Twenty Eight Days Later. You've got the berserker uh, zombies. It is kind of on an enclosed space, but it feels like a, a new take, just because of uh, you know, because it's on a speeding train. It's different, right? Um, there's this uh, movie that I really like. So, like, when found footage was the new thing, because it was so cheap, anybody can make a found footage horror film. You know, in the early to mid two thousands. But there's one that I really enjoyed. It's called VHS, and I think it was VHS 2. It has um, a zombie segment, but the premise of the zombie seg segment was brilliant and is one of the best parts of the movie. It's a guy who's um, mountain biking with his GoPro on his helmet, gets bitten by a zombie, and turns into the zombie. And so we're watching everything from the zombies POV throughout a zombie uh, post-apocalyptic movie when they're taking over the world and you, and you see you're watching the movie from the zombies eyes as he goes around biting people and eating people <laughs> and attacking people and it actually has a really great ending um, it's actually a really uh, um, I don't want to spoil it for people but it's, it's actually a really emotional ending at the at the end of that segment um, but yeah you someone found like hey like I'm doing a found footage movie which is a dime a dozen right now and everyone thinks they're cheap and crappy because we're on like paranormal activity 9 by this point and I'm doing a zombie film which went out of style you know decades ago how can I find a new um, twist on this to make it interesting and they did and that's why that segment's so memorable all right so I do need to say thank you very much to doc for supporting the channel with the super chat I'm gonna have to watch this later just wanted to say, um, I want to say it's awesome to see these kind of live chat topics too. Yes, these will be happening every every other Sunday right here on the channel with these uh, Comics Writing 101. Decided to not just do it on Twitch, we'll do it on Twitch and YouTube at the same time. So we do have one final question. This is from Trey Michael. Uh, what are your thoughts about YA girls saving the world in a recovering post-apocalyptic world? And why does the YA have a girl stuck in between two worlds and have to save them? It just seems so boring nowadays, or is it just me? <laughs> that, and that, that's a lot of, uh, <laughs> that's like he just like threw that sentence in the blender. I'm still trying to <laughs> process it. Um, yeah, well, with young adult novels, it's, it's the same thing that we were just talking about where people found a trend that really works. You know, you have what Katniss from the Hunger Games, like, oh, she is the chosen one. You know, she she's the, the in, what's her name from Twilight? I can't even remember. But like, oh, she's the one who'll bring the vampires and the werewolves together. It, it is that sort of uh, wish fulfillment kind of story. And there's nothing Absolutely. wrong with it. 
I mean, Harry Potter is every kid wants to want it to be Harry Potter. They wanted to have that owl come through their window and invite them to Hogwarts. And they're the ones who defeat Voldemort, uh, the bad guy, and save the day. Every kid wanted to be Luke Skywalker. You know, every kid wanted to have a, a bunch of robots show up in their backyard and say, oh, we need you to take this lightsaber and go up to the Death Star and, and defeat the Galactic Empire and kill Darth Vader, blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody wants to have that, you know, or geez, go back even further. Everybody wants to want to be Bilbo Baggins, have a bunch of dwarves and uh, Gandalf show up at the doorstep and say, hey, we need you to go fight a dragon. Come on, we're going to have an awesome adventure. It's going to be kick ass. Let's go. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can tell great stories. You can tell Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Harry Potter with, with those elements, or you can tell <laughs> ones that are... Well, it's interesting are... about Twilight. If you think about the Bella character, the main yeah, female, Bella, yeah. when they explain who she is, she's pale, she's very plain looking. It's like this weird fantasy where she, even though she's so plain and there's nothing all that interesting about her, the most beautiful man in the world that's immortal... And that, stop himself when he's around her. He just I think wants to feast on her body. <laughs> I think that's what separates um, something like Star Wars and Harry Potter, etc., from the excessive wish fulfillment and self-insert quality. That's kind of what makes Twilight read more like fan fiction. That's the than, problem with yeah. the the sequel trilogy is that you can see that that JJ JJ Abrams sees himself as Ray. So when Ray shows up on the Millennium Falcon, Han says. I need you to join the crew, you know, when she just all that she can fly and every, destroy. Everything is given to the character. You know, yeah. everybody, it's, it's almost like they have that emotional affirmation where everybody has to tell the character that they're great and they're perfect and they're special and they're the chosen one. Whereas in a story like Luke Skywalker, where we're talking about Star Wars, he's still nobody and everybody kind of, brings him down he's sort of caught up in this story and he isn't supposed to be there the only one who gives him support is obi-wan and even obi-wan makes him train um he has to earn his place throughout those movies whereas you have this you know these self-inserts oc characters uh these bellas and and these fan fiction kind it's of not characters. even fan fiction in the star wars that's fan in the star fantasy. wars yeah it's just a character who doesn't feel like a character because they don't earn anything everyone just tells the character and you know by by that they also tell the audience how great this character is and you never see the character really earning that or doing any of these great things we're just told that they're great and that's a case where you know it's a show don't tell situation no so one Dion everyone kind of jumps on what trey was asking there he says i think having a girl stuck between worlds is similar but different to the iseki genre in manga, anime, and light novels. However, the stuff between worlds angle could be literal or in allegory. Now, isekai is something I haven't really watched a lot of or read a lot of because there, there are genres that typically don't appeal to me. And isekai is one I haven't really gotten into. I know the gist of it, though, is the I've been reborn in another universe, and I'm going to use my knowledge of my universe to get an advantage in this universe. And there are there are lots of movies I've seen, you know, that that's um, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, you know, <laughs> it's like that, that premise goes back, you know, over a century. Hell, Army of Darkness, I love that movie, but that's the same uh, premise. It's, it's, it's a twist on the fish out of water genre. Um, I think Isakai, from what I understand, is their spin on it is that they use JRPG rules. So like, oh, well, you know, you're, you've been reborn in this universe, but you have to pick a class and uh, you have to uh, join a party and you have to um, level up your experience points in mana. And, and you have to like, oh, you killed a slime plus one, um, you know, mana points. And like, OK, so that. All right. I don't really get it. Um, but people love it. Isakai is, is, you know, huge right now, but it's only going to be huge for a little while longer. And then people are going to move on to something else once that genre gets oversaturated, just like zombies. I mean, remember the, the resurgence of zombie movies from the early 2000s when uh, 28 Days Later and Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead and then Romero came out of retirement and did Land of the Dead and all these zombie and The Walking Dead came out, all these zombie flicks, zombie flicks, zombie flicks, and then people enjoyed them until they didn't anymore and then it stopped. And, you know, that's just the way trends are. <laughs> Absolutely. By the time you're on diversion on those YA grabs, you're like, okay, yeah. it's time for this to end. I can only watch the same story so many oh. times. What was that one like? Uh, the the kid who's like the, turned out to be the son of Zeus, and they, they made a movie, and then Percy it, Percy Percy um, Jackson, Jackson, yeah, that was one of those things where they wanted to make a huge like franchise, like Harry Potter, 
and they made exactly one movie to set up their franchise yeah. and it bombed. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually not that bad. I think they ended up making three of them in total, but here, this will be the last question. We'll, we'll get one more in for Dennis Robinson. Why can't we get a new black hero that is a teenager and actually have interesting things about them? Not the most interesting thing being their sexuality. What is, what is it about that trend uh, with, with young I, new, new characters? I think because the premise that people start with um, isn't the character's personality. It's the character's uh, census data is like, okay, you need to write a story about a black teenager. I'm like, okay, anything specific about them other than the, the skin color? Like, no, it has to be a story about a black teenager. Like, okay, well, if that's the most important thing about them. Then that's what I'm going to zero in on in my writing and crafting this character in the story. And lo and behold, we have a story where the only thing that's important about this character is their skin color or like, and you have sexuality. to write a story about, yeah, you have to write a story about a, um, a, tr a homosexual character. Like, okay, so specifically it has to be about a homosexual character. Okay, so homosexuality is the most important thing about this character and that's what you know, the stories are gonna be about. You know, it's like when whoever it was that uh, had to relaunch Iceman as a gay character. It's like, you're gonna re write Iceman, but the most important thing about him is gay. I can't stress enough that this character has to be gay. Make sure no one misses the fact that Iceman is gay. Make him super gay. And so Iceman is just in every issue going like, hey, everybody wants to get Mochaccino, that's me, Iceman. And he's just talking like a total, like Iceman never talked like that for the 40 years he existed, but they, the premise going forward in that series was Iceman has to be so gay that nobody can miss it. And that's how you end up with stories like that, where they take that one quality and like, this is your, you hyper focus and fixate on that one quality so the audience can't possibly miss it instead of it just being a passing aspect of the character among many other aspects of the character. Yeah, it becomes the core trait rather than yeah. <laughs> one of the supporting traits of the character that, that, that makes them an individual. So I do want to say thank you very much. Obviously, Aaron Sparrow had to leave us, but he was here for the first 45 minutes or so. Definitely thank you very much to uh, to Mark Pellegrini for, for joining us. I think we had a wonderful conversation about genres. We answered some questions. Mark, do you have any last words before we wrap this up? And we will see you in two weeks. And I think we're going to start start talking about building heroic uh, archetype characters and their supporting traits. Uh, no, I had a great time, um, and I look forward to that conversation in a couple weeks. All right. Later, all. Thank you. See you.